Hello everyone and welcome to episode 21 of the Merry Go Round podcast. My name is Mary Brasha and I'm your host. This podcast is powered by Selkirk Sport. We are Pickleball. Before we hop into this episode, I want to talk to you guys about Selkirk's amazing line of pickleball nets. Whether you're just starting out or you're a seasoned pro, Selkirk has the perfect net for you. When you choose a Selkirk net, you're not just choosing any net, you're opting for the official net of the PPA Tour, where excellence meets professional play. With Selkirk's line of nets, you can play pickleball anywhere. Selkirk's range of nets cater to every player's needs, offering budget-friendly choices for casual enthusiasts and premium options for those with a competitive edge, ensuring quality play for all levels. So if you love pickleball as much as I do, check out Selkirk's Pickleball Nets. Get the freedom to play anywhere and elevate your game with the net trusted by the pros. Selkirk's got you covered. If you're interested in getting a net of your own, go to selkirk.com slash collection slash nets. You can also find this link in the description of the show. We just got back from North Carolina and had an awesome tournament on the East Coast. I always love Going to North Carolina, it's one of my favorite states, and I'm super proud of my sister Maggie and fellow Selkirk player Todd Foe on their epic run in mixed doubles at this tournament. They took out the 14th seed, the 2 seed, and then the 9th seed to make it to the semifinals, and it was just so fun to cheer them on all week, so good job, you guys. While we were in North Carolina, it was fun to catch up with some old friends and also try some good food places. We tried the Shiny Diner. My family loves diners, so if anyone has recommendations on good diners throughout the country, please comment them down below because it's always fun to go to those. And then we also had some frozen custard at a place called Good Berries. I heard it was a pretty well-known place in the Raleigh area. So I don't have frozen custard that often, but it's pretty good. So it's kind of a place we have to go when we're looking for our ice cream after a long day of playing. So the North Carolina tournament was a great tournament. Can't wait to be back next year. This week, Maggie and I will be traveling to Houston, Texas for this PPA event. And I'll also be playing with Jaume Martinez Vic in mixed doubles and some singles too. Shout out to him and Augie Ga. You know, if you watched the show, you saw that Augie was going to be the next superstar in pickleball and they made it to the finals. So I'm really happy for those guys. And can't wait to compete in Texas. Today's guest is one of the top creators in the pickleball space. He has 100,000 followers on Instagram and he has a big YouTube following. I love watching his instruction videos because they're super entertaining and fun and very helpful as well. He's also documented his journey on becoming a pro pickleball player himself. So I can't wait for you guys to hear from today's guest. It is that pickleball guy, Kyle Kazuda. Hello, Kyle, and welcome to the Merry Go Round podcast. Oh, heck yeah. I love the name of this podcast, by the way. This is like Merry Go Round. I mean, I remember, by the way, before you do your intro, when you did that shot. And then yeah. I like I did that. I don't know. I made a video of you at MLP. And um, I mean, one of many people who made a video of you. And then that's where it came from, right? That's where the name of this podcast came from. Yeah. The shot okay. was invented at MLP Columbus. And you gave me the first interview about my shot. I remember those videos. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> the funny thing about that, what I remember was I tried to hit the shot, which I'm, yeah. I'm guessing they'll put a put B roll over this or something, but I tried to hit the shot and it's like the ambidex, the ambidexterity required to hit that like random shoulder hinged around your neck shot is actually like nearly impossible for most humans. So I was very impressed. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I'm still rooting for you to, get it mastered someday. I am ready for that. But yeah, it's a tough shot. So I hope everyone tries it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But anyway, Kyle, where are you calling from this morning? Yeah, I'm at my house in Phoenix, Arizona. Okay. Arizona is one of my favorite places to play. But I know right before we started recording this, you were telling me that you just got off the court. So you already had 
a practice session today. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm super lucky. Uh, Arizona houses um, or Arizona properties, a, a, a lot of properties are so much land. So yeah. I, I live in kind of a small house, but the backyard is ginormous. And so I was able when I moved in here to pretty easily, like without having to move too many things, lay down a court in my backyard. And so, yeah, I had people over um, and then we literally went up until like five minutes before this podcast because we lo I lost the last game. So I was like, all right, we'll play seven more points. So we played <laughs> a few more points before we came on. Nice. Well, I remember I came to your backyard court to drill a little bit once, I think once or twice. And how nice you are living the dream with a court in your backyard. Do you feel like you use it every day? Oh, I mean, Mary, I don't feel like I use it. I know I use it every day. Um, but it, yeah, it's, it's really nice. I mean, uh, a lot of my friends, I'm pretty centrally located to a lot of people in Phoenix. So they come here a lot. And then for filming and stuff, it's obviously really nice because Phoenix, the public courts here, which there are a lot of, yeah. get super crowded. And so one, it's kind of hard to practice if you want to get multiple games in without waiting um, right. at a public court. And then two, just like filming would be more difficult. So it's, yeah, it's definitely the, it definitely is the dream situation. For sure, for sure. And before we jump into more about your pickleball journey, I want the people to learn a little bit more about your sports background because I know you were a pretty high level basketball player. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, uh, that was my main sport. I played like sixth, seventh, and eighth grade middle school tennis, like with along with basketball, and then um, dropped tennis when I got to high school played basketball uh, all throughout high school and then got a scholarship and played at the University of Louisiana at Monroe, which is kind of this small middle of nowhere Louisiana school. And then I transferred to um, Rollins College, which is in Orlando. So I played four years of college basketball and um, did some like basketball. My, my life was pretty much all basketball from when I was four years old until probably even I worked at a basketball camp company afterwards. So I was I was doing basketball till like 27. So it was like 20 years of basketball and then pretty cold Turkey. I was like, all right, I'm done with basketball. I'm going to start training for pickleball two years ago. So that's how I switched over. No way. Okay. And I have to ask while you were in Orlando, are you like a theme park person? Do you like <laughs> Disney or Universal yeah. or no? I feel like everybody who, who lives near some type of attraction like that gets asked that question a lot. And <laughs> I lived like 30 minutes from Universal and Disney World, and I probably went twice, and I lived there for like four years. And oh. it was only because it was only because like friends would come in and be like, you want to go? And I'd be like, sure. Because a day pass there would be like 100 bucks for the day. Yeah. And it's like a lot of lines and stuff. So no, I wasn't. I mean, it's fun if you go, but it wasn't really my thing. Okay, got it. Because I'm a really big Disney fan. And so if I went to school by Disney World, I'd be there like every night after my homework was done. Yeah. <laughs> but got it, got it. Okay. Yeah. Well, what a cool background you have. And so, yeah, you said that helped you get into pickleball. What attracted you to the sport of pickleball itself? The first time I played was because of, uh, a friend had kept asking me um, to play. Like a friend had asked me to play a bunch, and then I ended up going to play for the first time. And then uh, I got like everybody, I got hooked right away. I went back the next morning and I just showed up by myself. Didn't really know what to do. I didn't know how the paddle system at a public park works. So I just sat there and watched people play for like an hour. Like kind yeah. of weirdo. And then, then I, I got in some games. But then what ultimately attracted me, um, like at first I thought this story was unique to me, but I realized that everybody says somewhat some of the same stuff when it comes to this question. But it's it's picking up something you're not very good at, but then getting good at it fast. It's realizing that pickleball is very, very much of a puzzle and that puzzle constantly feels attainable to solve. And you do solve it little by little, and then you hit like a, a wall and you get frustrated and then you get over that hump. And then you do that like 500 times in the first year. And you just keep going back to the point of, um, you know, for me, it was three months of, that and then like about three months I actually remember i met pace Tioni, and i remember i saw this guy play and he's like the best player ever at the park and i got invited to play a game with him and i didn't really know how big of a deal he was in phoenix at the time um but that was really cool and so i played that game and then started getting invited to more games and then realized um i was obsessed with it and then pro pickleball wasn't as big of a thing at the time but i was like all right maybe i'll try to go pro whatever that meant and so i started training more 
Um, and that's when I really gave up basketball and was like, all right, I'm going to go all in on dinking and see if I can become a better dinker. <laughs> dinking. Nice. Well, clearly it was a good decision. And I love how you document your journey of like just becoming a pro. What made you want to do that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> what made me, I don't, I don't think anyone was actually asked me it like that before. Um, oh. Yeah, I well, so I used to do a lot of content prior to pickleball. I was working at a company called PGC Basketball. And so what I had done for essentially three years uh, and all during COVID, COVID was what actually sparked it was um, I was doing a lot of videography and editing for the basketball camp company because what happened was when COVID hit, um, actually, let me let me back up just for a moment. I, yeah. So my job was I would travel around to the, around the country in the summer and the fall and, and lead basketball camps for ninth to 12th graders who were aspiring college players. And cool. so I, I did that. But then when COVID hit, obviously the camps all shut down and our company pivoted to like, we need to create a lot of online content. So if, you know, with truthfully, without that situation, I probably wouldn't have been as big into content as I got into it, but I started video and editing like 12 hours a day because the, the life of the company was kind of at risk and like we had to create something that we could like do to serve the basketball community and also to make some money to the company and all the employees who were working for it like it didn't fail so it was really a survival thing and the guy who was always on camera for our company lived in town he's my best friend and it was like, all right, Kyle and Tyler, like go film a, a course for basketball. And so I was like, all right. So I'm like filming and I'm like watching YouTube videos and I'm editing and I'm making mistakes and I'm like learning how to use audio and I'm, and I'm doing all this crazy stuff. So I did that for, I'm not even kidding you. Like at one point it was 12 hours a day for like four weeks in a row. Wow. And then it was, and then it was like six hours a day for like the next six months. So I was just all in on it. So that led me to becoming full-time on the marketing team of that company. So then I was like doing a newsletter on the company. I was running the Instagram page on the company. I was doing some in camera, in front of camera work, but primarily I was behind the camera, actually like doing the back end stuff. So I had a lot of experience in that. Very basic. I'm not like some pro. I just knew how to push enough buttons to make it work. So like it, it yeah. came out okay. Um, but so then that's a long story short, that's how I got the experience. So when I started Pickleball, I, I was like, okay, maybe I'll just document this because, you know, if like, if it fails, it's whatever, it's cool to have documented this thing for 12 months. And at best it, I'll get sponsorships. It's kind of what's happened. At best I'll get sponsorships and it'll help pay for me to travel and play. And at very best, it'll like not, I didn't really want to leave my other job. I love my, I love my other job, but um, it's like at very best. I could just play pickup all the time um, and mm -hmm. not have to do other work. And so that's what ended up happening. Wow. What a story. I did not know all of the background on this. And so now it makes a lot more sense to me how you really got into the pickleball content creation and stuff, which is just so cool. Like, would you have ever thought that this is what you'd be doing full time? A couple no, of years you know, not at all. You know, what's kind of crazy because I haven't, I haven't stopped, I haven't talked about this in a long time, which is, yeah. um, I was really into newsletters and, uh, okay. for a while. So I, I was helping run our company's newsletter. And then I actually, for two weeks, was prepping to start a like marketing and storytelling and like, copywriting and a newsletter. Wow. And I was preparing and I had like written editions and I had landing pages and the software all set up. I, I was like yeah. going over to this library nearby and I was spending like, I, I probably spent 25 hours on it. And wow. so I was gonna launch it on a Monday. It was like, it was like Wednesday. I'm like, all right, I'll launch it on Monday, whatever that day was. And then my friend Tyler was said, well, what if, what if you just did pickleball content instead of like all this other content? And I was like, I don't know, like, I'm going to do this other thing because I was really interested in writing and storytelling. Right. And then he goes, I don't know, maybe consider that. So the next morning I called him and I was like, all right, I think I'm going to do both. I'm going to do pickleball newsletter and I'm going to do like marketing, blah, whatever. Right. And then 12 hours pass. And I was like, all right, you know, what? I'm just going to do pickleball content and I'll go back to that notion file that I have like saved somewhere and I'll do the, the other newsletter later. Um, and then, yeah, like two days later, I launched pickleball newsletter. I launched an Instagram page and there's like a Instagram post. Um, and it says like, I'm on my journey to start playing pro right now. And it was like, it was dated and stuff. Um, so I can't remember what your question was, but did I ever think I was going to be doing this? I think that's what your question was. Um, no, I didn't quite think this was the direction my life was going to be in, but I did, I did think 
I would be doing a lot of content because I, I yeah. really enjoy it. And like, that's a fun part of my life. So fun. It's so fun because you might know or maybe you don't, but I have a film background. And so yeah, I yeah. love creating. I love editing videos. And now being able, I mean, I'm playing mostly right now, but being able to edit videos in my free time, that's kind of what I do in the hotel at night when I'm done playing for the day. That's I'm awesome. always like trying to, you know, master my craft because it's a fun hobby. And the fact that you get to do it and play like, living the dream so happy for you and you. it's just great and inspiring for people and that's what i wanted to talk about a little more too is what are some of the things you've learned along the way things you would have done wouldn't have done because you have i think the most social media following in all of pickleball and so it's just so exciting on the content yeah side. <laughs> thank you yeah i think there's i think i'm close to okay uh, i think there's a couple of people um that have a little bit but you know like I think the what have I learned is um, there. Okay, maybe the first one is just keeping it simple with the technology. And yeah. I do get a lot of DMs about starting to do content in different realms. Like, mm -hmm. hey, I want to start making videos. And um, in fact, like, yeah, so it's like some other pros have called me at times, and they've like wanted to start, and they wanted to see kind of how what my process is. Because like when you yeah. don't do it, you just see it and you make assumptions about how the person is operating, but you don't really know, like, have they hired somebody? Are they doing their own thing? Um, I mean, the crazy thing is, I don't actually have my phone here, but it's over there, but I just use my cell phone. Like everything That's I film, crazy. everything I film is on my, on my cell phone. Um, actually, you know what? Hold on a second. Let me grab something. No, grab it. <laughs> so we like, are getting the behind the scenes look at Kyle's studio. <laughs> so, you know what? I live in actually, this is kind of crazy, but I live in like a, like a carport right now. So like I have a house that's next door, but it's like, I, I have a carport here and converted it to a, like a studio unit. Wow. And I, long story short, my friend and his family moved into the main house. So I'm living in like 400 square feet here. So it's literally like my bed's there. My kitchen's here. You see my microwave behind nice. my like coffee makers right there. Um, awesome. <laughs> the court, the court's back there though, which is all that matters. Um, yeah. But what if like, this is a big thing. So like, I have this right here and I have like these, these are the best mics. These are like DJI mobile, yep. like whatever. Right. And so kind of everyone uses these now. Um, and I have like a $30 tripod and I never, I know how to use a camera kind of, but it's like a lot of buttons to push. I never went that route. Um, because like I can film here I, and the way I film all my videos is I have two tripods. I have this camera, I have this phone and I have my buddy who comes over to help me off. And I just set his iPhone up. And then we push play on that one. We push play on mine. He airdrops me the footage and like, wow. that's all we do. And so like back to the question of what I learned is just keeping things super simple. And as long yeah. as you have really good audio, you can have like decent video. It's like, it's, the key. <laughs> yeah, it's harder to go the other way. Like beautiful video with bad audio doesn't work as well, but like just yeah. okay video with really good. So with good audio work. So um, I just kept it simple all along and I've never, the, the things I've tried to improve or um, just like improving editing, improving storytelling, improving um, the thoughtfulness of the videos uh, and, and like, how can I do different camera? You know, I've done some different camera angle stuff. I bought a drone, which is really cool. And I can just like set the drone up in the sky. And then like yeah. the, new, the new filming situation is actually more than two cameras. It's like two cameras. I throw the drone up in the sky and I just let it sit there. And it has like 28 minutes of flying time. And then mm -hmm. I, uh, I have some like meta Ray-Ban glasses. So I wear those and I like, record so um my my advice was keep it simple and then i just talked about how to complicate it but in general i made like 50 youtube videos with two iphones so that's that's how i've done it wow yeah. that is very impressive but also again inspiring because like you got to just start doing it that's the advice i always got from people with content is like you just got to go for it and do it and so you're definitely doing a great job with the content i wanted to tell the viewers of this show that you had a series on, you know, pro what I'm forgetting the exact. Oh, I think it was the, uh, it was the, the 18 advanced tips or something like to move up a level, I think was the title of it. And your mom, is yes. that right? Like, this... Yep. My mom found this series on Instagram reels and said, Mary, you need to watch this. These are great tips. And it was stuff that like, yeah, I mean, I'm playing all the time and training but it's kind of cool to hear from your perspective of like the pro tips and stuff you've seen because you really analyze a lot of footage too i'm sure and so oh, yeah. yeah yeah like it's interesting because to that point i 
I'm, I don't entirely have a tennis background, so yeah. the I've I've definitely leaned on the IQ side of the game more. Right. Like I'm trying to like develop my strokes and like they're solid, but there's so many things that my tennis friends all do so naturally that um, they're just harder for me. I mean, just like example would be like a third shot drive. Like that's not as easy for me consistently as like Augie Guff, for example. Like I watch this guy hit, and he's my buddy. He lives in town. Like I watch him hit third shot drives, and like. Guy hasn't missed a third shot drive since 97, right? <laughs> like he just makes every shot. And I'm like, I haven't yeah. made one since 97. So I think little things, but to that point um, is because I've done the content stuff, I get a, a different look at things because I have to, mm. one, you got to think about the content to like make it. So you're obviously like processing film and you're trying to grab clips. Then you have to teach. And anytime you teach, you know, you're, I love that quote. Like when you teach, you learn twice the first time you learned it. Yeah. And then the second time when you're teaching it. So, um, but I've also realized like a lot of pros, I feel like don't even, they don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> like, un, like, like consciously, like right. unconsciously, they're like super good. But if you try to ask them a question, they can't always consciously tell you like, I did that because yeah. of this. So that's interesting for me. I mean, I'm someone who's trying to constantly level up my pickleball IQ because pickleball is a game that requires so much like thinking and strategy i think i think you might have said this but it is like chess so yeah, yeah yeah i mean solving the puzzles of pickleball is always a challenge and yeah i think your videos do a great job so i watched some of them and i was like dang kyle i've learned some <laughs> new things and so uh, your videos helped. i remember i talked to you i think in arizona i was like kyle like oh my gosh your videos helped yeah. and that was just funny but um yeah. that's cool, cool. that's nice of you yeah, I mean, you've done so much on the content side. Now I want you to talk a little bit more about the playing side. Who do you mainly train with in Arizona? You guys have a really special crew. Yeah, there's a good group here. I mean, just uh, the Craig Johnson was just in my house, um, and Angie Walker and Alex Walker were just over here, and we we're playing mixed. Um, so those are those are three people. Uh, Kate Nemoff, Pace Tioni, um, Augie. Uh, there, there's there's more. There's, there's a group of probably, um, if, I, if I go too far down the list, I'll forget somebody and they'll get mad at me. But um, there's a good group of, of guys here. And in, now a lot more girls are playing here, which is really cool. Like we never played mixed a year and a half ago. Um, wow. For the most part, just like there, you know, there, there wasn't as many pro girls playing and now there are. So that's really cool. So there's a good group. And that's one of the hard things around the country. I know people DM me all the time and they're like, hey, I don't have anybody to play with. Like, is a wall sufficient? And I'm like, no. Oh it's like not sufficient past like some certain things, you know, and it's really hard if you're not playing yeah. against, like you're not seeing the ball that the high, the really the high level ball that you're going to see um, at, in tournaments. So it's, it's really valuable. We're pretty lucky here, but I think across the country, it's all, it's all, it's getting better everywhere. It's just slowly yeah. getting better certain places. And like, if you're in um, Delray beach, there's obviously a lot of players. If you're in Austin, there's a lot of players. If you're in Utah, there's a lot of players. Um, if you're in Phoenix, there's a lot of players and there's probably other, you know, there's quite a few other places oh, that have yeah, it. We have, we have yeah, I, mean, I, mean, no, I, don't, I don't think California is one of them, but there's a lot of other places. No, <laughs> yeah, California. <Yes. laughs> I, I was trying to, I was trying to tee you up to like come in I there know. and play California. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. No, but there are some places that I feel like don't have as much, but there's some really like concentrated areas, like where there's just so many people. So It'll be interesting yeah. to see how it keeps growing as the years go. Well, I think that in the concentrated areas are probably just gonna it's like it's kind of like a rich get richer scenario where like all the people are there. Like there's people that text me all the time, like, hey, I'm thinking about moving to Phoenix because they'd rather just yeah. go to where the games are. Obviously the weather is good in here yeah. in California. Um, but yeah, that, it's a cool scenario. Yeah. And I know not everyone has a court in their backyard like you do. So if you had to recommend a court in Phoenix for people to play at who are traveling there, where would you tell them to go? Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah, there's, well, one, there's a lot of public courts. So, okay. um, gosh, Gilbert Regional is a court. Tempe Sports Complex uh, is, a, is a court. I can't even remember all the names. of the, I haven't gone to th those public courts as much anymore. I, I go to Pickle Mall okay. quite a bit which nice. is an indoor facility. Um, it's just super close to my house. Um, I love indoor pickleball. It's the best. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, I mean, yeah, it's like, and then you go out and you play in wind and you're like, this wasn't in the indoor situation, but, um, right. 
but yeah, like there's a place called Pickleball Kingdom here, which is an indoor. There's a a new three court facility called, um, or it's a new facility that are opening three locations called uh, Center Court, which is opening up in a, in a oh, little yeah. while. So that, that's another one. Um, but it's usually if you just type in pickleball courts when you're in Phoenix, you'll you'll uh, end up seeing most of the courts. And it's like people ask me a lot about like where do I go for the good games, and I, I, the uh, truth is I don't I don't really know because I feel like when you go yeah. to public courts, it's always kind of hit or miss. Like from your level standpoint, like if you're a five zero. It's going to be probably unlikely you're going to find a 5-0 game at a bunch of public courts. Um, but I don't know. I'd probably just call one of those those indoor facilities when you're here to see if there's like 5-0, you know, groups going on. But, you know, it's, it's like it's probably like this for you guys. Once you get to a, a higher level, it's just texting like groups. And that's what I always recommend to people is like if you're trying to find more consistent games with better players when you're at the parks, which is what I did like every day for – four months we went to the same two parks and um you just you didn't know like you were sat off you played you sat off you played you're like oh that guy's pretty good um and like nico montoya like he was yeah. like like he was one of the guys at, at this one park that we went to so i was like all right let me get nico's number and then i'm like hey do you want to play and then eventually you get a group and you try to find the secret courts that no one knows about so that's kind of <laughs> the, that's probably really the only way that's one of the primary ways you can get good games and then if you join leagues and stuff which are happening more often so there's a few different ways yeah, I agree. Yeah, I personally like to set up my own games and I always just like to play with people that also like don't take it too seriously because it is pickleball and there's a time for both. Like, I should take that back. I mean, there's times where I want a serious focus game when I'm really trained for a tournament, but most of the time I just like to play my rec and have fun, try new shots. That's the time to do it in the rec games. Yeah. Like practice new things then drill those shots on the drilling court so really good advice for people looking to play places in arizona kyle i wanted to ask also how do you manage i don't know how many tournaments you're planning to do this year playing wise but how do you manage being a top influencer in this space and also being a pro player Top influencer. That's like a phrase that makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> you are, so I'll brag about you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I haven't, and it's like we're in April right now. I actually haven't played one tournament this year. And, okay. and the main reason was because I had a wrist injury that was going on at the end of last year, like a wrist and hand thing. So like I, I it, it took forever to heal. And like, no, yeah, anyway, so I was doing a lot of stuff to try to make it better, try to come back yeah. and play. I had to pull out of some tournaments. Um, so I've been training back for like two weeks now, which has been really good. Um, and I'm looking, I don't know what tournament I'm going to come back in yet, but how do I do it? Um, it's really not that hard actually, because, uh, I, I just have like created some systems in my life as far as content yeah. goes. So like, I'm going to do two YouTube videos a month. I'm going to try to do some type of short form series every month that, I can put out on, on short form platforms um, and then I'm going to write a newsletter and I've, tried, I've, I've stayed pretty focused on like, I'm going to do a newsletter, I'm going to do Instagram and I'm going to do, you know, YouTube videos and I'm going to plan my, um, you know, I, I, I only have to film like, you know, I'll film four, four or five days a month and then it goes to editing and I have editors that help me now, which has been amazing. Yeah. So I have like a good team around me on that. Um, and then I just train. So like a, a pretty consistent day for me would be like, I like to wake up early. So I'll wake up at five and I'll work from like five, <laughs> five to eight or something. And I'll do content yeah. related stuff. And, and then after eight, I'll start like training. I'll either go on court or I'll lift or it, it, it's like a pretty dream life. It's like, like legitimate pro, pro, pro life now, which is yeah. cool. So it's really, it's really not super hard as long as I plan well. That's kind of what it's come down to for me. Oh yeah, I'm a big planner too. Even sometimes yeah. there are those gaps in the midday where it's like, oh, I train in the morning, I train in the evening. What do I do in the midday? Do you ever, I'm just asking because I do this. Yeah. Do you ever go to like a coffee shop and like brainstorm all your content or do you have a place where you do that? Because I know I like to sometimes go oh, and yeah. just sit and like listen to jazz music and like <laughs> yeah, no, it's brainstorm. Just, yeah super normal i do that i mean i do yeah. that every i do that every i do it twice a week i mean there's a there's a couple yeah. of coffee shops close to me and um i i definitely like playing at the highest level is is actually my number one goal i just it's really fun to right. pursue and i want to continue like everybody i think is wanting to continue like leveling up and getting better yeah. and beating better players and 
you know, the, the, the process of getting to do that is really exciting, um, frustrating yeah. and exciting. And um, so like, I, I feel really lucky and I'll come back to your question, but I feel lucky I can have a thing over here that like activates the creative part of my brain. And mm -hmm. I can really focus on that for a few hours a day. And then I get this other part that's like physical and mental from a different angle. And so when I, you know, I'll practice in the morning and I'll have that midday, like that happens to me too. In the middle of the day, I'll go to a coffee shop and I'll just like, I do this a lot. I like like cardstock paper and I like really good pens. And so I'm a huge, like take a blank piece of paper and go just like draw, like, I don't know, what's the vision for a video? What's I'll write notes down. Yeah. Um, I'm constantly like you, I'm just like, I do it. I, I like, I, I like to spend a lot of time thinking about like zooming out and thinking what am I trying to do with my content stuff? Yeah. Um, and also like, what am I trying to do as a player and those type of things? I just find it helpful to write and think a lot. I think I'm trying me to get too. off my phone more. Uh, it just like overtakes me at times, which I got to work on that. But yeah, so I, I'm with you on that. Yes, I am very into journaling, writing thoughts. It's so fun. And yeah. Kyle, we're getting toward the end of this interview, but I do want to ask, what are some projects that, you know, we should be looking to see from you in the future? Oh, yeah, that's well, the, the number one thing um, I'm working on this year in addition. So so just one quick backstory is I, I have stayed pretty like keep the main thing. The main thing is a is a line I like to remind myself of, which is just like the main thing for me is make a good make great videos and that help people get better at pickleball and like hopefully entertain a little bit, but then also just write a, write, write a good weekly newsletter that does the same thing. And so those are been like my, like my projects for a while that it was like, it was newsletter and Instagram for a year. And then after about a year and a half, when I, I didn't feel like I was totally an imposter, I could teach a little bit. I started teaching. So I did a YouTube channel. So this is like year, this is year two of the, the, the YouTube channel or year one and a half. And now this year, um, I'm putting my focus to this thing called that pickleball school. And so it's like yeah. that pickleball guy, that pickleball school is the idea. So um, it's going to be in-person clinics, but not, I'm not doing a ton this year. I did two already. I'll probably do five or six later in the year. And what I'm working on this week is, is and then I'm going to be working on over the next few months is starting a, um, and like an online school per se. And I'm still navigating yeah. what exactly does that look like. But yeah. one of the problems with YouTube and anyway, and Instagram is you never know like if I make a, vi a video about beginners tips, I get like, hey, when are you going to make the advanced stuff? And then if I make a video about advanced tips, um, one, yeah. advanced tips don't actually get seen that much and people don't really care about those. I'm learning the algorithm. Like it's such a balance for me because <laughs> like YouTube, I'll make advanced videos. Nobody watches them. And I'll make like how to hit a third shot drop. It's like 700,000 views. And I'm like, oh gosh, do I need to make like a how to hit a third <laughs> shot drop video every week? Right. So I've just kind of, I'm trying to I'm trying to balance like what I think will help. So, so the point in saying that is um, YouTube is a little, you don't know when people are going to enter the uh, library of content. They could, and if they enter tomorrow, they might like see how to hit an Ernie as their first video from me. And it's like, they're a three L it's like, that's probably not the first thing you need to work on. So I um, still need to work on my Ernie Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> I need to. Yeah. I think everyone does. Um, but <laughs> The school idea is going to be a way to, um, I think for beginners and advanced players to create a more uh, connected um, and like step one, step two, step three, like a curriculum that is more um, like, hey, do it kind of in this way. You know, I don't know the, I don't know the way for sure, but I'm like, I'm going to give you an idea of a way to approach the game, to approach your improvement. And the way that I've followed um, from being like no tennis background guy to becoming a pro player which is like really hard for not having like much tennis background. Yeah. So that's what I'm working on um, this year a lot. I'm just going to try to do that really well. And the truth is it's not going to even be ready until like probably later this year. Cause it's, I'm trying to do it well, but that's the main focus for 2024. Great. Well, we will be yeah. looking forward to that. Kyle, last question that I have to ask you on this show is when you have a free day, which I'm sure is not often, but you decide to go to a karaoke bar with your friends. Oh yeah. What song are you singing? Oh gosh. <laughs> you know, I know you, you kind of prepped me with this question and I, I didn't have an answer when I got, you probably just want one line here, but I, 
this is the thing. I don't know the words to any songs. It's a weird thing. Really? I don't. You're I one of those. I can't like I can't remember them at all. Um, hey. So thankfully, karaoke bars have have a uh, right. ha- have the words on them. Um, but I'll probably go with like a Taylor Swift song and sing it like okay. like just because I know it'd be a fan favorite, and I would I would sing it with a lot of courage and um, a lot of a lot You'll of power. It. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll I'll commit to it, but it won't be good. <laughs> Good to know. Well, I hope to see that content on your Instagram page someday. Maybe we can all go that's, celebrate that's, a tournament victory and do that. It's <laughs> really funny. Oh, actually, you know what song I really want to do? It's, I want to sing that. I want to do that pickleball rap. I can't remember the guy's name. Who, remember the, who used to do that like way a long time ago at the tournaments? Yes. You were like yes. going to the um, pickleball wall, I think his name was. Yeah. I, yep. I just want to like, I don't know. I just used to get hyped up when he would do that. I'd be a little uncomfortable because I like it came out of nowhere. But then after I listened to it, I was like, okay, I like the commitment. It's catchy. Yeah. Catchy. It's yeah. Catchy. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Okay. Well, we will be looking forward to these performances. Kyle, thank you so much for coming on the Merry Go Round podcast this morning. I really enjoyed learning more about your journey. And yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Mary. Yes, and thank you to everyone who listened to this episode. We will see you next time. Bye.